tales for dark nights. Knuckle Supper Written by Drew Stepick Performed here by Jason Hill Chapter 1 Merchants Every once in a while, things went horribly wrong. Des, get her in the fucking bathroom, you asshole! I screamed, subduing the pimp by wrapping him across the neck with a crowbar. He dropped. Snot from his jughead splashed all over the hardwood floor. The dogs went into a frenzy in the backyard. And tell the dogs to shut up, I added. Des ran his fingers through his hair, trying to get it out of his face. I always wished he'd cut that shit hair of his. While licking gel off his index finger, he whispered, What the hell, bro? The pimp squirmed around. He was still alive. Our little blood theater wasn't a wrap. Not yet. He struggled to his feet and made a run for the door, but I tripped him by chucking the crowbar at his legs. It was enough to send him nosediving back to the floor. Unfortunately, I only managed to bone out one of his legs. I looked at Dez. He was restraining the little girl. She wasn't shaking. I think she was just shocked. She probably figured we were going to rape her. Just get her in the bathroom, dumbass. She's fucking twelve. Dez shot me a salute, opened the bathroom door and shoved the girl inside. He bolted it from the outside. You can be a real pussy sometimes, RJ, he said. You'd think that more junkies would find it strange that our bathroom had not one, but three deadbolts that locked from the outside. Then again, I took some mean smashes. My diet didn't exactly consist of low-fat chicken breasts stir-fried lightly with organic veggies. That being said, I wouldn't envy anyone locked up with me in close quarters. Without acknowledging that once I got high, I was going to beat the shit out of Dez for his stupidity, I proceeded to the pimp. While brushing the blood from his nose and out of his mouth, he crawled to our front door, trying to get the locks that prevented him from establishing contact with the outside world. The bathroom wasn't the only door with deadbolts. His yellow, chipped nails dug into the wood like he was holding on to the side of Mount Everest without a rope, a carabiner, or a spotter. Trembling, he got halfway up the door. His compounded left leg dangled sideways, more hindrance at this point than a method of propping him up. He felt around the first lock and dropped a little bit. I ripped off a stainless steel security chain from around my neck. Looking for these? I unhooked the clasp on the homemade necklace and let it unravel to my waist, revealing three keys on the end. The pimp looked at me, stunned. It was one of those moments when someone realizes that they're fucked. Dez ran from the bathroom door and snatched the key and the chain out of my hand. The pimp cried as his head rested on the door. Ah, please, bro. Ah, don't kill me. I'm nobody. He slid down to where his ascension began, defeated. They were always defeated in the end. Dez walked over to him. You are nobody, bitch. And now you're gonna get me high for the rest of the night. I grabbed Des on the shoulder. Don't kill him, idiot. You know that's not what we want. He shrugged off my hand and proceeded toward the bitch beater who was crying against his last hope to escape. Wait, uh, wait, 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 wait a minute. The pimp whimpered. I, I, I know who you are. He braced himself up slightly by planting his palms onto the floor. What are you? BBP? Sangre? Battlesnakes? His words stumbled as he pleaded. I I, 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 can, I can help you. This continued his trek. Wrong, motherfucker. Do I look like a Beverly Hills shithead to you? Do I look like a Mexican? Am I a fucking Rasta? We're knucklers. He stood over the trapped rat and kicked at his almost emancipated leg. The pimp slid backwards on his mitts. Then, without even hesitating, 
My snaky friend began thumping the chain and keys down on his head, using them as a weapon. Stop, Dez! In all reality, I didn't care if this piece of shit was mortally injured, but he had to be alive. We both knew that even a douche like this guy wasn't any good to us. Quiet. I nabbed Dez's wrist before the chain collided with the skull for the fifth time. Don't be a psycho. Do you want to get high or not? I ripped the chain out of his hand, tossing it into the dining room and added, I get first dibs. He flicked a blood droplet off his girly eyelashes. You always get first dibs. The pimp grabbed his leg and ran his tongue across his toothless gums. I walked back toward the coffee table, grabbed two loaded syringes, and wiped off all the asshole goop that had landed on them. Noticing for the first time that the vicious beating had pitched his gore over most of the room, I put one syringe in my front pocket. Hold him still. I looked at the bathroom door. Not a sound. Either the preteen girl behind it was scared, assuming she was next, or she didn't care whether or not we killed the asshole that drop kicked her down Sunset Boulevard on a nightly basis. Des got behind the pimp, secured him in a headlock, and extended his forearm toward me with a wrist held upright. Why did we go through all that? We should have just killed both of them at the same time. She's a junkie, RJ. Just hold him still. I commanded. You know there isn't another way to do this. You want to end up back on Skid Row eating rats? I bent down on one knee, inhaled the warmth of human, and grabbed the pimp about halfway up his forearm. Des freed up his arms from the headlock and popped both of the pimp's ears, causing the scumbag's head to waver around like a cartoon cat who took a frying pan to the face. Without wasting a beat, Des replaced his restraint with the legs by crossing them over the dude's torso, and then he looped his feet back around. With his hands now free, Des yelled for me to hand him the needle. I did as he asked. His hand was jittery as he accepted it. Don't fuck this up for me, dude, I insisted. Stay steady. Shit, you act like this is the first time something went wrong. Remember when that one homeless guy started squirting shit and piss all over the house? Who, me? He squealed, and he flippantly tapped on the cylinder and pushed the air out of the syringe. He tightened his leg lock, and the pimp's eyes rolled up, showing nothing but white. I was pretty sure the guy wasn't going anywhere, and we have superhuman strength and all that. I knew this was going to be more of a problem than it was worth. You and these fucking cattle... Like they give two jogs about you. He shuffled his hand with the syringe, emulating jerking off. Brown blood bubbled out of the pimp's mouth. He tried to chew on his lip, but he came up with nothing but gums and crust. The chain sprayed his teeth all over the carpet like we were playing 52 pickup in a dentist's office. My grip tightened on the forearm. I felt his heartbeat, and an orgasmic flush swept through my body. Whatever. I grabbed onto the pimp's middle finger, pushing the other fingers down and out of the way. Oh, you really need to get that hair out of your eyes, Des. I laughed and made a weepy emo face. Why? Are you a 15-year-old kid angry because his pussy hurts? (laughs) Des laughed a little and tapped at the needle again with the hand that was locked around the pimp's neck. Someday, you're going to thank me for always being here. You could never do this alone. I held up the pimp's middle finger. Fuck you. Get it done. One. Two. Now spike this asshole. Laughing, Des sunk the needle into the pimp's wrist. As soon as all the heroin was in his blood... I cranked the elbow quickly to the left and then to the right. Knowing the arm was loose by feeling the already brittle bone give, I commanded, Pull the plug! Without hesitation, Des pulled the spike from the wrist, and I tore the forearm from the pimp's body and held it vertically in the air. I quickly snapped off the fuck you finger directly at the knuckle. Then, 
I sucked and allowed the blood to flow into my mouth like some deranged beer bong. As I drank the sweet nectar, I scuttled across the floor, back to the coffee table. I searched around with one eye in my hand and grabbed a powdery new latex glove. I stretched out the glove with my hand and capped the end of the severed arm. Hurry up in there, RJ. This grit is going into shock and losing a lot of blood. If his heart stops, it's your ass. Both of Dez's arms were now taming the squirming body of the pimp. Knowing time was running out, I kicked over a glass bong and then inched the bong stand toward me with my right foot. Hurry! Dez screamed. Finally, I spit the knuckle out of my mouth, placed the arm in the bong holder, and dragged my rapidly fading ass across the floor. Dez released his legs and reversed his position quickly so he was facing his prey. He laid the body down on its back. I grabbed what remained of the already trashed arm, cranked it toward the sternum, and rested it above his heart. Dez dropped his weight under the pimp's chest. Trying to prevent more blood from coming out of the torn appendage, I wrapped a towel around the breakpoint, then massaged my leg across his chest, toward the still attached arm, hoping to redirect the blood flow. Dez hopped to the intact arm more sloppily than I had. He severed it at the forearm. I nabbed the needle from my front pocket, forced out the air, and tapped it as I tried to hold in the blood from the other arm. Keeping the dying pimp still, I took the needle and plunged it into a vein on the wrist. When the syringe was empty, Dez cracked off the knuckle with his teeth. As he started sucking away, I moved toward the top of the armless pimp, hugged his neck like a strangler with the element of surprise, and with one turn to the right and one turn to the left, I removed his head from what still remained of his torso. The chest plate sucked in one last time and gassed out from his five open holes. He pissed and shit himself. Dez managed to make it over to the coffee table to get his latex cap. I tossed the head aside and went back toward the bong display. That's a mess, Dez joked. His eyes rolled back and forth from the heroin. I held up my arm bong for cheers. He just fell backward on a beanbag chair. Oh, fuck you then. I said, turning the arm up to my mouth. Call one of your little Desians to clean this up. Desians. That's what I called his pussy-ass followers. The dope began flowing with the blood of the pimp through the dust inside of me. I felt nice. Warm. Comforting. My head nodded back and forth and bobbed from side to side. The feeling was so comforting because it was the only thing I ever knew how to feel. Heroin meant more to me than my body, my face, my words, and even my brain. Des and I are in a pack called the Knucklers. Yeah, I suppose we're vampires, but more importantly, we're junkies and gangster motherfuckers. Alright, RJ. Yeah... What are we going to do about the girl in the bathroom? Oh, yeah. That's a good question, Des. Usually after Des went to go fade for a few hours, I listened to music in my own days. I was a collector of old school British and American vinyl 7-inch punk rock records. Something about the sound was so raw and so shittily recorded that it always put me in a really good vaporous state. It was kind of like being in a slow motion scene in a movie where you faintly hear music, but it sounds like a single speaker boombox being broadcast through a tin can. Adding to the majesty of my circulatory antifreeze, my dogs howled at the Los Angeles wind chimes outside. That's police sirens to you tourists out there. I worshipped the smell and taste of the heroin that summer night. The drug was always quite a bit more pleasant than the blood that I had to use to bulldoze it into my system. I always have some blood in my body, but it's more like a small reserve of canteen water being carefully monitored by someone lost in the desert. It depletes, and it doesn't come back. 
I spent hours, or probably more like minutes, sifting through my stacks upon stacks of records, spreading them out all over the floor, and looking at the artwork on the front that was more often than not a Xeroxed paper. The biggest pain in the ass was when I was in a state of fucked upness, was switching out the little yellow spindle adapters that go in the middle. I thought for a long time that I'd just buy a thousand of those things and just put them inside all of my records to make things a lot easier. For me, though, that took away time from killing people and doing drugs and shit. After all, I led the knucklers. I tried to be careful not to bust any of my 45s because they were collector's items. Sad thing is that I often flopped around on the floor like a fish that just landed on the deck of a fisherman's boat. As I sipped away in the pimp's arm, filled with that sweet garbage nectar, I dropped my knee onto a record and cracked it. It sounded like a bone breaking. Pissed off, I flung it across the living room into the kitchen. I didn't look at what it was. I hoped when I woke from my glaze that it wasn't one of the expensive ones. They were hard to replace because when they originally came out, the bands only printed about a hundred of them. It was always a great thing to be wasted, at least while it was going on. I sat on a cloud and convinced myself for the longest time that I remember everything in the morning. I rarely did, though. I looked in the direction of the record I shot like skeet. I went to see what it said on the label and whether or not the wax was fixable. Then, I tripped on my own feet, knocking my arm bong onto the records. God damn it! I yelled at myself. I picked up the bong and grabbed a Harrington jacket off the couch to dab away the mess. Thankfully, most of the records were in plastic sleeves, but the dust that collected on them was mixed with blood, urine, phlegm, and whatever else was in the pimp's dislodged arms and head that turned into this atrocious, gelatinous concoction that made me vomit. Barfing made things much worse. I tried to suck it back down my esophagus, but as soon as the barf retreated back toward my stomach, it snowballed and came back up, bigger, stronger, and far ranker. Stymied, I slumped my back against the entertainment center behind me and crossed my arms like a frustrated little baby, bumping the needle on the player across the entire record. Then, I scratched my forehead. I immediately realized that I was rubbing wretch combined with the pimp's special sauce all over my head and hair. I tilted my head sideways, let out a big oomph, and asked myself rather impolitely, what the fuck is wrong with you? Meaning me. Looking around the room filled with heroin needles, body parts, shit, piss, vomit, records, blood, and a stiff pimp, I answered my own question. Oh, yeah. Old RJ was never defeated, though. Like I told Des earlier, one of his little Desians should come over and clean the mess. So, I picked myself up, cautiously, and made my way past my bedroom and knocked on his door. Des! I asked. No response. Des! Can you call one of your little pussy shits to come over here and clean up my mess? I opened the door a crack. Dez was sprawled out on my guest bed, covered in blood and narcotics, hugging his chunk of the pimp like a whoopee. Hey, Dez! He rolled away from facing the door and let out a high-pitched wheeze. What the fuck do you want, RJ? His whiny voice stamped my ears. I stayed out of the light in the hallway. I didn't want him to see what a mess I had made of myself pig pen for the peanuts gang would have been ashamed to hang with me. I brought my negativity down a notch. So, Des, I was wondering, I began as I picked a chunk of puke off the side of my nose, if you can call your friends to come clean up? The house is a disaster. Des shot up in bed. Close the fucking door, you junkie. We'll have them clean it tomorrow. Fuck, dude, the heroin wasn't that good. He threw his portion of the pimp at the door. The severed arm slammed across my face, creating a wind pocket that blew my own stench directly up my nose. I put my hands up to my mouth, but it was too late. Sp 
bunk bombed through the alleys between my fingers and drooled down my arms to my elbows. Seemingly forgetting everything that had happened in the past hour, I quickly unbolted the bathroom door and took off my shirt. After throwing it in the shower, I headed toward the sink, cranked on the faucets, and began cupping water all over the upper half of my body. I swear that I saw stink lines and squiggles emanating from my head. It was pretty rare that I gave myself a full sink bath, but turning on the shower at that point seemed like more of a chore. If the sink is good enough for the French, then God damn it, it was good enough for me. After I was somewhat satisfied, I turned off the water flow and dragged my feet back to the living room. I figured I'd start cleaning. I blacked out instead. About an hour later, I woke up. I looked over to my right. All my records were stacked nicely. I take that back. They were stacked, sure, but in between each one, sludge dripped over the sides, making the mound look like a shit sandwich with all the fixings. That's funny, I said to myself. I don't remember doing that. I had never in fact ever stacked my records until the morning, because I always wound up in a situation like the bodily chaos I created earlier that night. I eyeballed the room to see if Dez had called one of his Desians to come over and clean while I was passed out. No one was there. Mm. I knew Dez didn't clean it up. Like a kid on a pogo stick, I suddenly bounced to my feet and ran down the hallway toward the bathroom. I tried to reassure myself that I had stacked the records, but it was pointless. Even that fucked up, I wouldn't have left the puke and sludge all over them. Sure enough, when I reached the shitter, all the bolts were unlocked. Still too wasted to use my brain enough to decide what I was going to do about the little whore in there, I swiftly and discreetly locked all the dent bolts. The last thing I wanted to do was explain to Dez how she got out of the bathroom. On top of that, she had been in our living room, stacking my records, for some reason. Good evening. This is Jason Hill, host of the Horror Hill podcast. You've been listening to a chapter from the award-winning novel Knuckle Supper by best-selling author Drew Stebeck. Knuckle Supper, Ultimate Gutter Fix Edition, and its critically acclaimed sequel, Knuckle Bald, are available now from Bloodbound Books. Check out the links in the video description and sticky comments below to pick up a copy today and show your support for indie horror. Also, please consider making a donation to Children of the Night today and help end teen prostitution and human trafficking. Children of the Night is a privately funded nonprofit organization established in 1979 with the specific purpose of providing intervention in the lives of children who are sexually exploited and vulnerable to, or involved in, prostitution and pornography. Visit childrenofthenight.org for more information today. From author Drew Stepick and all of us here at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, thanks for listening and for your support. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.